I'm in the heart of the historic Treme neighborhood here in New Orleans. The Backstreet Cultural Museum is just down the block, as is St. Augustine's Church and the Tomb of the Unknown Slave. This neighborhood is about 75 square blocks. It's bounded by North Rampart over there, Esplanade over there, Canal over there, and Claiborne all the way over there. There are those who will extend the boundaries further than that, but those are the original historical boundaries of this neighborhood. Now, the Treme is typically regarded as the oldest African-American neighborhood in the country, because as early as the 1720s, there were free people of color owning property here. Many of these free people of color were the descendants of the white aristocracy and their black mistresses. And many of them also had a vested interest in the mercantile system of slavery. The first Louisiana native guard, who I mentioned in my Gods and Generals video, actually was made up of free people of color and fought for the Confederacy for a year before they promptly switched sides. After the Civil War, this mixed race population was in a damned difficult position. Because before the war, there had been a three-tiered caste system here in New Orleans. You had whites at the top, free people of color in the middle, and slaves at the very bottom. And when slavery was abolished, so was, by definition, the caste system. During Reconstruction, there were four main political groups jockeying for control here in the city. You had your carpet-bagging Republicans from up north, you had ex-Confederates, the Afro-Creole elite, formerly the free people of color, and former slaves. Many of the former slaves had served in the Union Army, and they came back home with more education, more skills, and generally more experience in the wider world. And they arrived home and they saw the injustices that their community still suffered, and they figured that they had all the tools they needed to help them get out of poverty and oppression. Now, two of these political groups decided to try and help them do that. The carpetbagging Republicans came to the former slaves and said, hey, look, we can help you. We'll advocate for you. People listen to us. You've just got to vote our way in elections. Meanwhile, the Afro-Creole elite also came to the former slaves and said, hey man, you know, you're black, we're black, let's be black together and fight the power. As you can imagine, former slaves were equally skeptical of both offers. The Republicans they saw as transients to the city, people who would make their money and reputations here and then promptly return to New York or Massachusetts and abandon these former slaves once they had outlived their political usefulness. So the Afro-Creoles, it wasn't much better with them because they would look at these Afro-Creole elites, it's in the name, right, and say, wait, wasn't your granddaddy a plantation owner? Weren't you enthusiastic participants in the system of slavery that kept us oppressed for hundreds of years? So yeah, it was a bit of a pickle. The ex-Confederates, meanwhile, were humiliated by their defeat during the war, and they had absolutely no problem with resorting to violence to achieve their political ends. Famously, in 1866, a group of African Americans met in Mechanics Hall here in New Orleans to uh, attend a Republican convention. The ex-Confederate mayor of the city then ordered the police force to break the meeting up. So the police showed up and murdered everybody. It was called the Riot of 1866, though, honestly, it should be called the Massacre of 1866. And then there was the Battle of Liberty Place, which was a whole thing in of itself. Uh, that's, that's a topic for another time. So when federal troops left in 1877, these ex-Confederates passed Jim Crow laws, which were designed to keep the black man down and increase their hold on power. And they really screwed the Afro-Creoles in the process. It didn't matter, you know, with racist laws like the Separate Car Act of 1890, it didn't matter if you were partially white. If you had any amount of African blood, then those segregationist racist laws applied to you. So here's the white man, think about it, here's the white man coming up to you, who, and he's, by the way, your second cousin. <laughs> And he says, it doesn't matter that you think you're privileged. It doesn't matter that you were educated in Paris. It doesn't matter that you come from a white aristocratic family. You're black. You're just as black as the son of a freed slave. As you can imagine, these Afro-Creoles did not take this lying down. And it was those mixed-race Americans, largely based here in the Treme, that kick-started the first civil rights movement here in the United States, which culminated in the infamous landmark Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson in 1894. But this wasn't just a Creole neighborhood. The slaves of the Treme and their descendants made a huge impact on American history and culture. The Treme, specifically Congo Square, is the birthplace of jazz. And during the first couple decades of the 20th century, jazz was really nurtured in the legal red light district here in New Orleans, Storyville, which is just a couple blocks upriver of here. That early jazz was incredibly filthy. 
I mean, if you're playing in brothels for tips, you really have no incentive to change your music up. And people would basically simulate sex on the dance floor. The lyrics were super explicit. There's even been some speculation that the word jazz is derived from a slang term for male ejaculate. I'll let you guess which one. Those early days of jazz were the golden era of the Treme, but after World War I, this neighborhood got hit by a one-two punch. In 1917, the Army and the Navy demanded that Storyville be shut down. They deemed it as a negative influence on military personnel. I really couldn't see why, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, to their credit, the city government resisted, but in the end, they really had no choice but to shut the place down. Uh, and after that, money just stopped coming into the neighborhood like it once did. Then in 1919, the French Opera House on Bourbon Street burned to the ground. That opera house was like the main tourist draw in the city of New Orleans. And so the city panicked and they decided, well, we've got to build a new center for the arts. And they decided, let's put it in the Treme. Trouble was, there were already people living here. People's homes, buildings, people living in them. It was a neighborhood. But the city didn't have too much regard for the poor black residents of this neighborhood, so they simply demolished their homes and evicted the people living in them and built the Municipal Auditorium, which is a gigantic eyesore of a building. The irony is that in building this new center for the arts, the city displaced dozens, perhaps even hundreds, of jazz musicians, scattered them to the wind, never to return. To make matters worse, after they built the auditorium, the city ran out of money. And the area that is now Louis Armstrong Park remained an empty lot for 50 years. It was finally in the 60s that they decided to build the Victorian Pleasure Gardens that are there now. And it was around this time, in the late 60s, that the city delivered the Coupe de Gras to this neighborhood. Now, before this, Claiborne Avenue was the center of African-American commerce here in the city. There were hundreds of black-owned businesses uh, shaded by beautiful oak trees. It was a spot to hang out, you know, go after church, have picnics, Whatever. Well, the city decided to build the I-10 corridor directly over Claiborne, cutting down the trees like the fucking orcs of Isengard. The old world will burn in the fires of industry. The forests will fall. New order will rise. These black businesses were either destroyed outright or driven out of business. And this impoverished the Treme almost overnight. With poverty, of course, comes drugs, crime, and gangs. Pretty soon, this became a really, really bad neighborhood. The Iberville Project sprung up over the ruins of Storyville, and this was not a very nice place to live for decades after that. Even like 10 years ago, I would not have wanted to set up my nice camera on this street. And then Hurricane Katrina came through and things changed again. Now, the Treme is on relatively high ground and there wasn't the kind of flood water that you saw in places like Lakeview or the Lower Ninth, but there was still enough to do serious damage to people's homes. But the people of the Treme are resilient, clearly, and they rebuilt. For a while there, it seemed like things were getting better. The crime rate slowly but surely went down and this became a nice place to live again. But inevitably, real estate prices started going up. And carpetbaggers like me from out of town started pricing natives out of their homes. As the New Orleans tourism industry recovered, Airbnb started breeding like rabbits. And the impact of short-term rentals on our working class neighborhoods remains a huge issue of contention in the city to this day. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that every single aspect of gentrification is bad. It's a really complicated issue. And frankly, I don't even pretend that I have the answers. I don't know. I have no solution to this. People want to, there to be less crime in their neighborhoods. I mean, that's just obvious. We want to walk our dogs at night without having to look over our shoulders, of course. But I will say that there's a house just around the block from here that I used to pass almost every day on my way to work at my old job. This would have been about three to five years ago. And every single time, without fail, I would see a big black family sitting on their porch, drinking beer, eating lunch, playing with their kids, whatever. Now when I pass by there, I usually just see tourists. Typically a white kid in a college hoodie playing on his phone and smoking a cigarette. And that's kind of sad. So on a slightly unrelated note, I would just like to uh, mention something. Um, so on this channel in the past, I have been heavily critical of the eighth season of the show Game of Thrones. And I just wanted to say that I actually rewatched it recently and 
I can't believe how wrong I was. I have a whole new appreciation for it. I mean, of course Daenerys turned evil. You know, they were, they've been building up to that for eight whole seasons, you know? Like Tyrion said, when they killed the slave owners, no one said anything because they were evil men, you know? It's just so reminis reminiscent of the Nazis, you know? When first they took the slave owners and I said nothing because I was not a slave owner. It's just mwah, br brilliant writing, brilliant, brilliant, totally tasteful writing. And I mean, of course, Jamie went back to Cersei. That makes total sense. He's like an addict, man. You know, he's like an addict. He goes back, he just relapsed very tragically at the end there. So I just want to extend a very formal uh, and sincere apology to David Benioff and Dan Weiss. I'm sorry. I can't do it. I'm sorry, man. I can't do it. So my, my patron, my very generous patron, Dylan Abbott, is part of the Stonewall Brigade, which means that he gets me to do a shout out of his choice at the end of a video a month. And he asked me to defend season eight of Game of Thrones. I'll never forgive you for this, motherfucker. I will never fucking forgive you.